Okay, so this is where we left off last time. We had made our boundary layer equations uh, dimensionless, and we ended up with these equations here. Um, we said that we did that because it showed us what important dimensionless parameters uh, exist inside of these um, equations. So we had the Reynolds number, uh, the Prandtl number, and the Eckert number. So what we're going to do now is try to understand how if we solve these equations for some specific situation, we can use the solution, the dimensionless solution, to develop correlations, which are uh, dimensionless solutions that give us the maximum utility um, associated with our solution. So let's imagine, first of all, solving the fluid dynamics portion of these equations. So these, um, these upper two equations, continuity and momentum, coupled together, right? If we don't have any temperature dependence of any of our properties, these two equations could be solved without thinking about the energy equation. So the solution would be the velocity distribution, right? You would be solving for the velocity um, in the flow, and uh, that velocity would be, let's see, it would be a function of x and y for sure, so x and y. And then it would also be a function of Reynolds number because the Reynolds number appears here. And it would be a function of that free stream pressure gradient, right? So this might be a function of position x, but it's a given function of position for a given shape, right? So that's an input to our, to our problem. So our, our solution will be a function of that pressure gradient uh, function as well. So u will be a function of x, y, Reynolds number, and dp, d, dp infinity, dx, and so will v, right? These are dimensionless quantities. So if you want to try to visualize that, you know, you basically have solved for velocity uh, u squiggle everywhere inside of the flow. Okay, so here I'm showing u squiggle as a function of y squiggle at two different x squiggle positions. Right? This is going from 0 um, to 1 out here. Remember, u squiggle is u over u infinity, so out here it will be 1. And then you know, farther down the plate, you would have the same thing it would just extend farther out into the free stream. And the plate itself, the surface, goes from zero at the leading edge to uh, x squiggle equal one at the trailing edge because you know this is non-dimensionalized based on the length of the plate, so zero to one. So that's the um, information that we get from the solution, and it's a lot of information, um, you know, the velocity everywhere. Um, but it's important to think about what we really want out of that solution. So I don't really want to know the velocity everywhere. You know, if I'm an engineer, I'm probably more interested in the engineering quantity that I'd have to design around, right? So for flow over a plate, that's probably the shear stress right on the surface. If it's flow over some other body, uh, maybe pressure uh, form drag is important, and I, I'd also want to know the the, the drag force, or if in fact, I'd want to know the drag force. But the point is, is that th that's the engineering quantity of interest. And this engineering quantity of interest, the shear stress, is definitely related to the, the velocity distribution, right? So the shear stress at the surface of the plate is given by this equation here. It's viscosity times du dy, evaluated right here at y equals zero, right? So this is the local shear stress. It depends on where you are along the surface. It's going to be high here because the boundary layer is thin, and it's going to get lower and lower and lower as you move along the surface of the plate. And it depends not on the velocity distribution everywhere. It depends specifically on the, the, the derivative of the velocity with respect to y right at the surface at y equals 0. So we can um, try to understand how to make this shear stress dimensionless, right? So Here's the shear stress. Um, first thing I'd like to do is express it in terms of dimensionless quantities. So instead of u and y, maybe u squiggle and y squiggle. So that's what I did here. I just introduced the definition of u, which is u squiggle times u infinity, and y, which is y squiggle times l. And then I pull out the u infinity and the l, and that's what I get here. So this is my shear stress expressed in terms of u squiggle and y squiggle. So now, just like we establish the inputs in dimensionless terms, right? We have Reynolds number and, and so forth. We, we need to remember how we're going to take this shear stress and uh, express it as a dimensionless shear stress, right? And the dimensionless shear stress is called the friction coefficient, right? So the friction coefficient, this is a dimensionless number, and it's the shear stress 
but is um, normalized, it's divided by rho u infinity squared over 2, right? So this is the friction coefficient. It's a dimensionless number, and this is the dimensionless output uh, that we care about uh, with regards to this velocity distribution. So now I can figure out what that um, is in terms of our dimensionless um, uh, variables. So here uh, I just uh, substituted in this equation here into this equation here, and I get uh, 2 rho u infinity squared, or 2 over rho u infinity squared, and then here I have mu u infinity over L, and then the, the, the gradient of u squiggle over y squiggle at y equals 0. And if you stare at this, oops, if you stare at this um, equation for a little bit, you'll see that uh, this is actually just 2 over the Reynolds number. So our friction coefficient is 2 over the Reynolds number times the gradient of the dimensionless velocity at y equals 0, right? So Whereas our velocities are a function of x and y and the Reynolds number and dp dx, the friction coefficient, at least the local friction coefficient, is not a function of y. It's only a function of x and the Reynolds number and dp infinity dx, right? Because I'm taking the gradient only at y equals 0, right? So the only place I care about the solution is at y equals 0. So our local friction coefficient is a function of x. It depends on where you are along the plate. It's a function of Reynolds number, and it's a function of what the free stream pressure gradient is doing. So that's uh, already um, a significant reduction in the number of parameters, right? I only need three parameters to know exactly what's going on. Um, typically, I'm not that interested actually in the local friction coefficient. I don't really want to know what the local shear stress is in any location as much as I'd like to know what's the total force. So what is the average shear stress, right? And the average shear stress is obtained by integrating the local shear stress over the entire width of the, of the plate. So here um, is the local friction coefficient. We could just as easily define an average friction coefficient based on the average shear stress, right? And that's what I've done here. So if I substitute in our equation for the local shear stress into this equation for the average shear stress, I get this right here. And I substitute this equation for the uh, average shear stress into this equation for the uh, average friction coefficient, which I've done here, I end up with this uh, equation right here, right? Which is, you know, again, this group becomes 2 over the Reynolds number, and now I'm integrating the velocity gradient at y equals 0 from x equal 1 to x equals 0 to x equal 1, right? So if you think about it, not only does this... Um, average friction coefficient not depend on y because I only care about the solution at y equals zero. It also doesn't depend on x, right? Because I'm integrating from x equals zero to x equals one. I'm integrating over the entire body. So whereas the local friction coefficient depends on x, Reynolds number, and dp dx, the average friction coefficient depends only on Reynolds number and dp dx. So this is where we got to then. We had our um, solution to those equations for whatever shape we happen to be looking at, right? We had the u and v, dimensionless u and v are a function of uh, x and y and the Reynolds number and um, the pressure gradient. Uh, but that um, the engineering quantity of most interest to us, which is the average shear stress, uh, when expressed non-dimensionally, so this is the average friction coefficient, is only a function of the Reynolds number and the, and the free stream pressure gradient. And that should make some sense to you because we're only interested in the derivative of u with respect to y at one location, y equals zero, which is at the plate surface, and we've integrated away the x dependence because we're interested in the average over the entire surface. So this is our um, sort of outcome. This is the friction coefficient correlation for whatever shape we want to look at, right? And whatever shape we want to look at is really saying whatever free stream pressure gradient we want to think about, right? If we have a flat plate, then this free stream pressure gradient is just zero. There's no free stream pressure gradient. But if we have flow over something like a cylinder or a sphere or whatever it is, this free stream pressure variation will be important, right? And it will change the result. But for whatever shape it is we're interested in, this free stream pressure variation will be imposed on the boundary layer solution. So for a given shape, our average friction coefficient is only a function of Reynolds number, right? And um, that's really useful for... Um, for flat plates, in most uh, situations, in fact, almost all situations, um, we're much more interested in 
uh, the drag force, and therefore we're more interested in the drag coefficient. But you can basically go through the same kind of reasoning and realize that the drag coefficient is only a function of, of the Reynolds number as, as well, where the Reynolds number is based on whatever characteristic length you've chosen to define for your given shape. So this drag coefficient is how we make the, the drag force dimensionless, right? And the way we do that is uh, we take the drag force and we divide it by um, rho u infinity squared over two. So that's a pressure. And we multiply that by a sub p, which is a projected area. Right, so just to be clear, this is the area that you would see if you were looking at your object in the direction that the flow was coming. So if we had a sphere, this projected area of the sphere would be a circle. Right? If we had a cylinder, the projected area of a cylinder, if we're talking about flowing across a cylinder, it would be a rectangle. Right? So whatever that is, that's how we define the, the drag coefficient. And again, what this is telling us is that the drag coefficient is only a function of one dimensionless parameter for whatever shape it is you're interested in, right? So for example, um, you know, if you're interested in flow over a sphere, the drag coefficient is represented completely by a, a chart that looks like this. And this was based on data um, taken over a long period of time, but they took that data uh, and they expressed it in terms of a drag coefficient as a function of Reynolds number, right? And this is pretty remarkable, actually. This says that the same chart, right, drag coefficient as a function of Reynolds number, you can use that chart to analyze, you know, if you shoot a BB through the air, so a very small sphere, you know, being shot through a very low density fluid, or if you took a, a big cannonball, and you dropped it in the ocean. So a, a large sphere in a much um, higher density fluid. You know, whatever the scale, whatever the fluid, whatever the velocity, you know, you can, you can, you can use the same chart to analyze the situation provided it's flow over a sphere, all right? And you'll have a different one of these charts for flow over a cylinder, you know, flow over different extrusions, you know, flow over basically whatever shape you can think of. There are handbooks of fluid dynamics and heat transfer that are just filled with this kind of information of drag coefficient as a function of Reynolds number four, whatever, right? And um, I'll also show you how to find uh, those correlations uh, in the Ease library as well, where they've been programmed. All right, so again, this is a heat transfer class. So we can't, you know, we can't stop with velocity distributions we have to move on and think about temperature distributions and heat transfer coefficients. So if I want the temperature dif distribution for a convection situation, you know, I have to solve the momentum equation and the axial momentum equation and get the velocity distribution. And then I have to use that velocity distribution down here in the energy equation. You can see that the solution that I got for these two equations becomes a part of this equation here, right? But once I have the velocity distribution, in theory, at least, I can solve uh, this equation here, again, for whatever shape it is uh, that I'm interested in. And the outcome will be uh, the temperature distribution, right? So the temperature distribution will depend on x and y for sure. Uh, it'll depend on everything that the velocity distribution depended on because the velocity distribution becomes part of this. So the Reynolds number and the free stream pressure gradient. And then it will also depend on the Prandtl number because that sits here and the Eckert number because that sits there. So here's the functional dependence of the temperature distribution. And again, this is a lot of information, right? This is the dimensionless temperature any place inside of the flow, right? So here I'm showing the dimensionless temperature at uh, you know, two different uh, dimensionless x positions, right? And remember how the dimensionless temperature uh, it was defined, it was T minus the surface temperature normalized by the free stream to the surface temperature difference. So at the surface, the dimensionless temperature needs to be zero. And then as I move out towards the edge of the boundary layer, I should get to one, right? So I would expect to see you know, a temperature distribution that would kind of look like this. And, uh, you know, again, my, my dimensionless X position goes from zero here at the leading edge. And as I move along the surface, I finally get to one, which is I'm you know, at the, at the trailing edge of my surface. Okay, so we can go through the same kind of logic here to try to figure out, you know, what does the engineering quantity of interest depend on, right? This is the temperature, which is interesting, but um, not directly relevant if I'm trying to build a heat exchanger or something like that. So, 
the engineering quantity that I'm most interested in is probably the heat transfer coefficient, right? And the heat transfer coefficient, uh, if you remember from Newton's law of cooling, is the, the rate of heat transfer, the heat flux right at the surface, right? So that's convective heat flux, uh, divided by the surface temperature minus T infinity, right? So Ts minus T infinity. This is Newton's law of cooling, right? Q convection is H times Ts minus T infinity. So this is what I'm interested in. And this, as I've... Um, Defined it here is the local heat transfer coefficient, right? This is definitely going to uh, vary depending on where I am along this surface. If I'm very close to the leading edge here where the boundary layer is very thin, I would expect the heat transfer coefficient to be really large. And then the heat transfer coefficient will decrease as that boundary layer thickens, right? And basically the heat flux goes down. So we'll do the same kind of thing here where... Um, I'll take this and try to express it in terms of my dimensionless quantities. So the heat flux here is uh, by conduction, right? So conduction at y equals zero, and this is conduction on the fluid side. So this is minus k of the fluid times dt dy at y equals zero. Right? So if I plug this into my heat transfer coefficient, I end up with this. And then I'd like to express t and y in terms of dimensionless temperature and dimensionless y. So I've done that here. So here I have uh, um, theta hat times t infinity minus ts. That's what I put in here for t. And then y is y hat times l. I'm going to pull out the t infinity minus ts and the l and uh, bring them outside. And of course, this cancels this and gets rid of the negative. And I have that h is k over l times the gradient in the dimensionless temperature with respect to y at y equals zero. Okay, so just like I wanted to take the shear stress and express it in a dimensionless form, I want to take the heat transfer coefficient and express it in a dimensionless form. And the dimensionless variable, the dimensionless uh, heat transfer coefficient is called the Neusselt number, right? So um, the Neusselt number is defined as h and uh, then we divide by k and multiply by l, right? h, l over k. So here's my heat transfer coefficient. We just got done deriving this. I'll plug it into the Neusselt number, and the k and the l cancel out, and I find out that the Neusselt number, the local Neusselt number, is really just equal to the gradient in the dimensionless temperature evaluated at y equals zero. So that's kind of interesting. Um, that tells you that even though the temperature is a function of x and y and Reynolds number and all this other stuff, the Neusselt number isn't a function of y, right? The Neusselt number only depends on the gradient of that temperature at y equals zero. So even though there's information everywhere else, I only care about the solution right here at y equals zero. So the, the local Neusselt number is a function of the dimensionless temperature, Reynolds number. Again, this tells you what the shape is, the free stream temperature gradient. And then we have the Prandtl number and the Eckert number. So just like um, with the shear stress, you know, it wasn't um, so important to me what the local shear stress is. It's not usually so important to me what the local Neusselt number is or the local heat transfer. Right? I don't really care in most problems what's going on right at this particular location. I'm more interested in what's the average heat transfer coefficient? How much energy does this body give off integrated over its entire surface, right? And so I'm interested in the average Neusselt number. The average Neusselt number is the Neusselt number based on the average heat transfer coefficient. And again, because now I'm averaging over the entire surface, I'm going to average from uh, dimensionless x equals 0 here to dimensionless x equals 1 here, that x dependence goes away. And my average Neusselt number is only a function of Reynolds number, uh, free stream pressure gradient, Prandtl number and Eckert number, right? So that's pretty, pretty cool. Um, if we're talking about a, a specific shape, so here flow over a flat plate, I know what this pressure gradient is. Flow over a cylinder, I know what the pressure gradient is. You know, whatever it is, for a given shape, I can say that the Neusselt number, the average Neusselt number, is only a function of the Reynolds number, Prandtl number, and the Eckert number. So. Um, one more thing that we almost always do is we say, well, typically it's not a function of the accurate number because viscous dissipation is negligible. So if the accurate number over the Reynolds number, which tells you how important viscous dissipation is, if that accurate number over the Reynolds number parameter is much less than one, then the Neusselt number, the average Neusselt number is really only a function of Reynolds number and Prandtl number.
And again, that's a pretty remarkable um, result. It tells you that uh, you really only need two dimensionless parameters to calculate the average heat transfer coefficient for, um, for a given shape, right? And that leads you to um, charts and equations and, and functions that look kind of like this, where we have average Newcell number as a function of Reynolds number. You know, unlike the drag coefficient, we can't just get by with one line because we also are a function of Prandtl number. But we can get by with a series of lines, one for each Prandtl number, right? So if I know the Reynolds number and I know the Prandtl number, I know the average Newcell number, right? And again, you know, handbooks are just filled with these kind of charts. This is the chart associated with flow over a cylinder, but there's one associated with flow over a sphere. There's ones associated with flows over various extrusions that look different and crazy. And, you know, you can go on and on like that. And uh, just like I said before, I'll show you how to find these also uh, in the Ease Heat Transfer Library uh, in, the next, uh, in the next video.